Hey everyone, this is Thatcher. We're back at it again with another DCTL tutorial. This is going to be the second episode in my series. Uh, the first one in which we're going to be working on an interesting DCTL exercise and trying to learn new concepts. In this video, we're going to be going over a DCTL that does the clamp operation. And before we get into this, let's actually go into why we would actually want something like this in DaVinci Resolve. Interestingly, one of the selling points of DaVinci Resolve is that unlike other softwares, it does all of its processing within a floating point space, which means that it has this enormous dynamic range in which we can go well above uh, 1.0, we can go below zero, and those values are still retained provided we use certain operations. As an example here, I can take the lift, I can jack it way below zero, I can take the gain, I can bring the highlights above one. In a following node, I can bring the highlights back down, I can bring the lift back up, and you can see that I haven't clipped anything within this image. At first glance, this does seem like something that is a desirable quality. Let's reset our grade and take another look though, because there are actually some operations in Resolve that do not perform correctly or do not perform as expected when given a negative input. So as an example, I've made a serial node here and I'm gonna change the color space to HSV. Oftentimes people have a node graph in which they will save certain operations for certain nodes. For instance, in this one, because it's now in HSV space, I might apply a gain to just the second channel, the saturation. However, we'll notice that within this node, that I'm going to title HSV, I have not actually done any operations yet, so I would expect it to do absolutely nothing to my image. However, if I go into our first node and take the lift down and our gain up so that we can see, We'll see that at a certain point, we end up with this blue kind of fringing that shows up in the talent's hair. Now this doesn't happen if I turn off the second node, they're actually clipped down to zero. So the HSV node, node number two, represents an operation in which negative or perhaps super white values have resulted in some kind of image artifact. Now why is this the case? So potentially we can actually avoid this. I've made the same demonstration in Fusion. Okay. So here we are in Fusion, we have the same clip, and here I have a color gain node in which we can scale it up and down, say, so now you can see the waveform goes above 100% and it goes below zero. And then we have a color space conversion to HSV. You can see that in the green channel, in fact, it's really going well above 100 and well below zero in the saturation right here. If I bring the lift up so that, so that we just barely cross the, the zero level in all three channels, we can see that my saturation channel becomes contained to the zero to one range, even though my input image is above 100%. As a result, what we would like here would be to provide our RGB to HSV conversion with a signal that is between zero and one, or at least greater than zero. In Fusion, this actually isn't too difficult. What we can do is we can make a custom tool, and for each channel, we're going to set it equal to clamp of that channel. Let's go ahead and copy and paste that to each of the categories. Now, if I lower my lift a ton, or raise my gain a lot, you can see that my saturation channel, the second channel here, is always between zero and one. Whereas if I disable my clamping operation, the saturation can exceed 100% and go well into the, the negative territory. This custom tool exists in Fusion, but it doesn't exist in the color page. So let's make a DCTL that does the same operation that we just did here, constraining the input code values to be between zero and one. I've switched back into Visual Studio Code and I'm going to go ahead and create a new DCTL. I'll call it DCTL Tutorial 1 Clamp dot DCTL. Next, as in the intro video, we're going to go ahead and find the transform function signature. We found it over here. We're going to copy this transform function verbatim without changing any of the parameter names into our file. Now, let's refer back to my guide on how to actually write code. 
We've figured out what math we want to execute, which is to constrain our code values PR, PG, and PB into the zero to one range. Let's go ahead and write this as a list of operations. The first thing I'm going to do is identify the minimum and maximum code values that I want to have in my output image. Next, I'm going to make sure that our R, G, and B values do not exceed the max allowed code value and do not go beneath the minimum code value. And I'll finally return the result. Let's go ahead and actually implement the code here. I'm going to start off by defining the min and max values. Let's say they're 0 and 1 for now. Next, let's define the float 3 that we're ultimately going to output. We're going to initialize it with the current input image colors. As before, we're going to use the make float 3 function. Now that we've defined out, we're going to make sure that its three components do not go outside this range from minval to maxval. There are several ways to do this. Perhaps the most naive way would be to simply use if statements to check if PR is larger than maxval or if it's less than minval, and if so, constrain it to be either maxval or minval, and then to repeat the same process with our green and blue channels. However, DCTLs actually have a variety of built-in functions that we can take advantage of. Let's go over to the documentation as described in the intro series. If we scroll down, we can see that there is a list of the supported math functions that come with DCTLs. And there are four that are relevant to us. There's fmaxf, fminf, clamp, and saturate. Max returns the larger of the two inputs. Min returns a float that is the smaller of the two inputs. Saturate clamps the input to be between 0 and 1, which is effectively what we're doing for each of the three channels here. But clamp f is maybe the most flexible because it allows you to specify the minimum and maximum value that you're allowing the input to have. Let's use clamp f on the three channels. I'm going to access and update each of the three code values within out using dot x, dot y, and dot z. And I'll clamp them to be between minval and maxval. Let's repeat this with Y and Z. It goes without saying that dot X refers to the first entry in the in out, dot Y is the second entry, and dot Z is the third entry. Finally, now that we've clamped out to be between minval and maxval for all three channels, we're going to go ahead and return out. OK. Let's go ahead and install this DCTL in Resolve and see if it works. We'll find it in the Finder, and we'll drag and drop it over to our LUT folder. Let's go over to Resolve, and we'll have to restart Resolve. We're back in the color page within Resolve, and we're back to the image in which we have a lot of contrast applied. Let's make a serial node, bring in the DCTL, and select our clamp DCTL. We can see that when the DCTL is turned on, the blue fringing effect that we get up here disappears. As a result, that suggests that it worked. Of course, in the color page waveform, we can't actually see sub black and super white values. As a result, let's take a look at our fusion composition. Here we have our composition from before, in which our gain is set up so that we have super white and sub-zero values. Let's add the DCTL over here and see what happens. We can see that when we switch to this node with the clamp DCTL, we are now constrained to the 0 to 1 range, as expected. Now, we could end this tutorial right here, but I would prefer to add another feature to this clamp tool. In many scenarios, I don't actually want to clamp both the top and bottom of the waveform. I only want to make sure that the input to a tool is non-negative. As a result, I want to have the ability to choose whether to clamp the top, the bottom, or both. 
It turns out that Resolve provides the ability to add parameters to your DCTLs so that the user can control the tool. These parameters are specified in the documentation, so let's navigate there now. In section five of the documentation, we can see that there are actually five different kinds of parameters that we can have in a DCTL. There are float sliders, int sliders, value boxes, which is simply a float slider that doesn't have a minimum or maximum allowed value. We have check boxes and combo boxes, which is like a drop down. Resolve provides five examples of these sorts of parameters. And the meaning of every single entry in each parameter is described up here. Typically, there's a variable name that specifies where the final value will be saved. There's a label that will be presented to the user. There's a macro that you have to specify, and there will be a default value. On top of that, int sliders and float sliders also require you to specify a min value, a max value, and a step size for that slider. Although my understanding is that the step size is typically ignored by Resolve. I've already copied and pasted these five parameters into a DCTL so that I can show you what that looks like. Here's the DCTL. It's simply an empty transform function. Well, I suppose it has the make float three statement in it. And it has the five parameters verbatim copied from over here. So we can see how they look. Back in Resolve, let's take a look at this DCTL that I made. I've loaded up the DCTL inside the DCTL open effect. It's worth noting that DCTL parameters can only be accessed if the DCTL is loaded up within one of these effects. They cannot be accessed if you load it up as one of the LUTs. We can see that the float slider allows you to choose a value within a certain range, as does integers, although integers do not allow anything after the decimal point. Here we have a value box, which allows you to specify any kind of arbitrary number. Here we have a checkbox that can either store a zero or one. And finally, we have the combo box in which you can specify which of these values will be shown to the user. Going back to our clamp DCTL, I would like to add a few different features to this DCTL. First, I would like to be able to specify what the min and max values are that we're clamping to. And they should be shown here as either a value box or as a float slider. Next, I would like to be able to choose whether or not I'm clamping the min, clamping the max, or clamping both. Let's go ahead and implement this. I've navigated back to Visual Studio Code so we can go ahead and add these parameters that I've described. First, let's add the min and max values. We're going to go ahead and write define UI params. We're going to allow us to specify min val. We're going to call it minimum value. We're going to show that to the user. I think we'll make this a value box so that you can choose any value you want. I think by default, users will want to clamp the minimum to zero. And we'll do something similar for the max value, setting it equal to one by default. There we go. These variables defined within defined UI params are accessible within the transform function. If you have defined other functions within the DCTL, you cannot access these parameter values from there. You can only do it from within the transform. As we have already identified the min and max values, let's go ahead and move this comment to the very top and delete these two lines that would override our parameter values. Next, we want to allow the user to specify whether they want to clamp to the min, clamp to the max, or clamp both. There are potentially two ways that we could do this. One option would be to use checkboxes, and the other would be to use the combo box. Let's try the checkbox first. We're going to write define UI params, and we're going to make a flag called clamp min. It's going to be a checkbox, and it will be set to 1 by default. 1 represents true. 0 is false. In fact, strictly speaking in C, 0 is false, and anything else is true. This will store the value 1 in the variable clamp min. Clamp min is going to be an integer. 
Let's do something similar with Clamp Max. Again, I'm going to assume that by default, the user will probably want to clamp both the min and the max when using this DCTL. So I'll leave these both at one. If I thought, for example, that the user would probably not want to clamp the max by default, then I'd probably set this to zero. OK, now we evidently have a problem, because clamp F will always constrain the red, green, and blue values to be within this range. However, if the user has unchecked one of these two boxes, clamp min or clamp max, I would prefer to not actually clamp that value. So we're going to use a built-in function other than clamp f. We are going to use f max f or f min f to get around this. Let's comment out these three lines and then write out what we plan to do instead in pseudocode. We're simply going to read the two flags, clamp min and clamp max. And if they are checked, then we'll only clamp the min or we'll only clamp the max. And if they're both checked, then both clamps will be applied. We're instead going to do the clamping with min and max f. If clamp min is checked, then we want to return the code value out.x, out.y, or out.z only if it is greater than minval. OK, so here you can see that I've evaluated if clamp min is equal to 1, then we'll take the max of each channel and minval and assign that back to that channel, overwriting it if it is less than minval. If clamp min is not equal to 1, then this block will not execute. Let's do something similar with clamp max. There we go. Now let's get rid of this old code that we commented out just to clean it up. And we're ready to try out this DCTL again. Let's go over to resolve and hit reload. We can see that we continue to not have the blue artifacts in our hair. As a result, that indicates that the DCTL is successfully compiled. We can further check the logs and see that at the tail of the logs, there are no compilation errors. Let's take a look. If we uncheck clamp min, then we see that our artifacts come back in the hair. Additionally, we could instead choose to clamp at a different value like 0.5, which makes a terrible looking image. Suppose instead of this UI, we wanted to have a drop down menu in which you could choose from clamp min clamp max, and clamp both. Let's see how that would look inside the code. We'll comment out these two lines, and we'll write define UI params, clamp mode, and I'm going to show clamp mode to the user, and we're going to make it a DCTL UI combo box. Then we're going to provide a default value, which We'll make clamp both. And we're going to provide two sets of arrays. The second one indicates what text to show to the user. And you have to watch out in some of these text things because there are certain characters that you're not allowed to have in them. But that's OK. We're going to stick to plain English characters. We're going to have clamp both, clamp min, and clamp max. When the user chooses one of these options, such as clamp both, the variable clamp mode will be set to one of three different values, 0, 1, or 2. 0, 1, or 2, however, will be labeled with an enum. So that'll look something like this, clamp both, clamp min, and clamp max. Here, I've chosen the names of the enums. Effectively, what's going to happen is the compiler will remember that clamp both in all caps represents the integer 0, clamp min represents the integer 1, and clamp max represents the integer 2. 
down here we'll replace our code with the logic needed for a new parameter. We're going to check if clamp mode is equal to clamp both. If so, we can actually recycle the logic that we had originally in this DCTL. Like this. Otherwise, we're going to use an else if statement. We're going to see if the clamp mode is equal to clamp min. Equivalently for these if statements, I could have written if clamp mode is equal to zero, or if clamp mode is equal to one. However, it is somewhat cleaner and it allows me to reorder the parameters later if I simply refer to these by the enum name specified in this array. We can go ahead and move this code up for clamp min. And finally, we can check if the clamp mode is equal to clamp max and move our code in up here. We can remove our old code statements as well as our old parameters and we are good to go. Let's copy this back into our LUT folder and see how it looks in Resolve now. Hit reload and now we have this nice drop down for clamp both, clamp min, and clamp max. We can see that if I choose clamp max, we get the artifact back in the hair, but in the other cases, we do not. Just to make sure it works, let's clamp the max value at 0.7 and clamp the min value at 0.3. I'll make the waveform a little brighter so that you can see what's going on. And if I choose clamp min, we can see only the bottom is cut off. If I clamp both, the, both the top and bottom are cut off. And if I do clamp max, just the top is cut off. Finally, I suppose what you might have seen here is that using these value boxes is somewhat inconvenient because you have to type in numbers manually rather than being able to choose it as a slider. So let's replace these two parameters with a slider float. We're going to go back into Visual Studio Code here, and I'm going to replace these two parameters with DCTL slider float as described up here in the documentation, like this. I'm going to keep our default values from before and allow the user to choose a range from negative 2.0 to positive 2.0 with a step size of 0.01. Let's do the same thing over here for maximum value. We'll save the DCTL and go back to our finder to copy and paste the DCTL over. Let's take a look at Resolve. Hit Reload, and we can see that now we have sliders that allow us to specify the minimum and maximum value in a more intuitive way. However, these are unfortunately constrained to the specified ranges. So this isn't exactly suitable if you're willing to have a unbounded range of numbers. This concludes this episode of the tutorial. We've gone over how to look up parameters within the documentation, as well as how to implement slider floats, checkboxes, value boxes, and the combo box. Additionally, I've shown you the list of supported math functions so you know where to go if you want to do something more complicated than basic primitive arithmetic, such as multiplication or addition. Thanks for watching, and I'm excited to see you in the next episode of our tutorial.